<laughs> this trip I'm going to tell you about, uh, you know, all four of us that went on this over the years, we've heard a lot of people come up to us and say, you know, I was going to do something wild when I was young, but never did. Um, there's always this long pause, and you see they're trying to figure out why they never went. And uh, so this is just one adventure that's out there. All right, well, we'll t start off telling you where everybody's from. We all grew up in Iowa. I'm from La Porte City, which is about there. Uh, the other three guys grew up in Remsen, which is about here. We started somewhere about here in Minnesota and ended up up there. Uh, total distance, about 1,400 miles. Uh, this whole thing started on this lake. Uh, this is near Pelican Rapids, and uh, Hank Kohler, uh, one of the guys from Northwest Iowa, was just a little kid. He's up there fishing with his dad on this lake, and just to pass the time, his dad said, hey, you know where this water goes? And Hank's a good Iowan, you know, to us there is no other river than the Mississippi. And so he said, well, yeah, it goes to the Gulf. And his dad said, no, this water goes north. And so that's the day the dream was born. It was from that simple conversation that triggered the idea in Hank's in Hank's mind. And he never forgot that. So Hank's on one side of the state growing up, I'm on the other. That's my first canoe there. My dad built that for us. That's my two brothers. That's not Iowa. We don't have water like that. That's Minnesota. Uh, this is uh, one of the canoes we took back when it was new. Uh, if any of you recognize that, that's the landing out here at Moose. Uh, <coughs> That's a 1966 Chrysler, 1966 Dad. <laughs> and uh, Dad did take us to the Boundary Waters here once when we were kids. Um, just for a little four or five day trip, and yeah, that's us. Uh, and yes, they dressed us that way. <laughs> it's amazing we didn't get beat up every day in school. That's a garbage bag. Yeah, you know, we had some high tech gear, as you can see. Uh, and then I went again uh, when I was about 17. Another couple other buddies and I came up here and we did another about four or five day trip. Uh, that was pretty much the extent of any of our wilderness or camping experience. The other three guys hadn't even done that. I met up with Hank when I was going to school. I was going to Iowa State and working at this pizza parlor. Uh, you know, every kid's got to work at a pizza parlor when you go to college. And one night in the kitchen, Hank starts telling me about this plan of his. And, uh, you know, the same people kind of backed away from him a little bit. And uh, I thought, well, you know, this sounds like fun. And so a year later, it was Hank, his brother Keith, and a friend of theirs by the name of Rich Whipke and I, uh, we headed out. Uh, now, we started in New Fergus Falls, and uh, uh, on the Otter Tail River, and this is day one, May 8th, 1979. Whoa. Yeah, if I was going to do it again, I'd wait. <laughs> it get cold up there. Man, we didn't know this. The guys have only been out like four days. We froze that first couple of days. So wait, before you go on, is that a 15-foot square stern you're battling or a 17-foot uh, stern? It's 17 foot. 17 foot. And uh, it just and yes, this is what we used. I mean, we were college students, we didn't have a lot of money. And so Hank bought that at a garage sale. <laughs> and if you look closely, you see these little stars and this red here, and you can kind of see a blue stripe along there. The previous owner of that canoe thought so highly of it, he painted it red, white, and blue and used it as a float in the parade. <laughs> That's the quality of the gear we were going after. <laughs> uh, there's still ice on the shore. Oops. Oh, it was cold. Yeah. It was cold. <laughs> uh, we're on the Otter Tail River to start with, and it's actually a very pretty little river. It has about a half a dozen of these little dams on there, and these are hydro dams. They actually generate electricity here. And Rich and I had some fun below one of these. Nice curvy little stream, and we're just screaming through, and we're having a riot. Came around a corner, and there's a tree laying three quarters of the way down, you know, across. <laughs> there's a little gap on the right, and we're like, well, we can make that gap. Well, it's not a good story if we do. <laughs> so, of course, we didn't. <laughs> and we hit that tree broadside, and what oh. it did is it catches you in the shoulders, throws you in the upstream side, and then it drives you down. And it pinned us underwater against that tree. Oh. And I got to tell you, you don't know how powerful that water is until you're trying to come back up against it. And we couldn't. But we got lucky. Uh, the canoe flipped into the current and it filled with water. And that created enough pressure that it pushed some of these branches out of the way and made a hole. And it took us with it. So that's day three. You know, I, I was ready to go home. <laughs> Hank had promised me fun. And so far, I hadn't seen a whole lot of that. 
works. <laughs> yeah, it snowed on us the next morning. Just that kick us over. <laughs> the sun did finally come out, so we took a picture of it. <laughs> we spent about five days moving to the southwest, uh, over to the North Dakota-Minnesota border. And by the time you get there, you're in farm country. And it's North Dakota flat. I mean, there's North Dakota flat and rest of the world flat, not the same thing. Uh, there's not a hill anywhere. Uh, that's Hank in the front, by the way. That's his brother Keith in the back. He's six foot nine. <laughs> so he had to be in the back. We tried him in the front once, but he's like this. <laughs> uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, this is our this is day one on the Red River. Um, see how happy everybody is? <laughs> There's day seven. <laughs> That's why. Oh. You can paddle on that river for half an hour and be farther south than when you started. Huh? <laughs> you know, you get to a spot like right here, and the water's like right over there. Just you know walk. it's there. And you know it's going to take you forever to get there. There are sections of this river where it's it's so flat, it only drops an inch and a half in a mile. That's all the fall there is. It's pretty slow going here. This was just an old farm uh, silo that I thought was kind of cool. Uh, there's food in town. This, I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but this night got out of control. We ended up in some farmer's hayloft till 5 a.m. Yeah, playing basketball. We'll just leave it at that. This was the first indication that we'd had that some water had flowed through here. And this was the second. That's a bale of hay. That's how high the water was about a month before we came through. And a quarter mile upstream from this, there was a cow in the tree at that height. Uh, but it was all rotted and gross, and so we didn't take a picture of that. Um, and th this is the Red River. I mean, you guys are all familiar with this. It's Fargo Grand Forks, and they have the massive floods. Uh, you know, I've I got to tell you, I've seen floods before, but it's really different being on that water and looking up and seeing stuff hanging in the trees. It gives you a real different perspective of what a flood is all about. And the 79 flood actually was one of the biggest in history. Up until the 97 flood, it was the biggest on, on many parts of the red. Uh, we finally caught up to it uh, at Drayton. And uh, we said, well, heck with this going back and forth. Let's just cut through the trees. And we deemed that legal because we were still on the water. We'll go over that. This was an interesting spot. Uh, well, first of all, you can see some more of our fine gear. Uh, I think Hank t bought that tent at Penny's. <laughs> that's where you go for the good stuff, right, Steve? <laughs> you, know. you can see we've already duct taped plastic to that to try to keep it from leaking. Uh, but this was an interesting spot because there were five little houses out in the, in the country there. And we always stopped to see if we could camp and never turned down once. The folks along the Red River were great. And uh, we went from house to house, and nobody's home. And we, but we could look at the basements, and they're still full of water. And we got to that last house, and we could look into the kitchen, and there's still cornflakes on the table. So when the flood came, these people just left and hadn't been back yet. It's kind of spooky staying there, actually. Here we are, Pembina, North Dakota. We're right, uh, right on the border now. Uh, the flood had gone down a little bit during the night, so we had to walk through the muck. That's Red River mud. I cannot describe this stuff to you. Uh, there's a gentleman who lives along the red. He can explain. Yeah, he can tell you about this. This is just the nastiest goo you will ever walk in. They call it tiger poop. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's a new one. I got to remember that. <laughs> uh, but we're doing this. <laughs> and this uh, this old guy here comes out here. He's got a camera. He's got a Polaroid camera. He's going to take a picture of us. And so we're thinking, whoa, well, what a nice guy. So I go over there and I start schmoozing him because I want the picture. And I said to him, I said, well, what are you taking the picture for? And he turns and he says, guys back in the bar won't believe this. <laughs> he walked off, took it with him. <laughs> I got to say, if that's the entertainment in Pembina, you know, they got to get something else going on up there. Uh, met some girls here who lied about their ages. Found that out two years ago. Told us they were 18, but they weren't. <laughs> Nobody's going to jail. We're okay. 
We didn't know how much alcohol you could take into Canada. <laughs> so, this seemed to be the easiest way to remedy that problem. <laughs> we didn't want to get into trouble. Drink it quick. Uh, the border crossing was interesting. I won't get into that, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. Let's just say they aren't used to people walking up from the river. This is our first night in Canada. This turned out to be one of the best stops of the whole trip. Mm -hmm. uh, we pulled up to this farm. There was a young guy there about our age, and he's like, yeah, you can camp here. And he came down a little bit later and said, hey, you guys want to go to a social? And we're like, well, I don't know. What's a social? And he said, it's a party. You'll like it. And what it turned out to be is what they call a wedding social. It's a party they have for a couple that's getting married. They have it before they get married is to raise money for them. You give them money. Uh, and he took us there, and we met uh, this group of friends of his, and they were just this really close-knit bunch. And we had such a good time that we stayed another day, uh, went to a park, uh, played basketball for uh, an afternoon. A couple dozen people here. Well, it's sort of basketball. They don't really differentiate between hockey and basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rough game. <laughs> this is Diane here. This is the kid whose farm we were at. And I went back to Manitoba last summer for the first time in 30 years. And he owns that farm now. And I spent five days with him and his family. And we had another party, and about 20 of these people showed up. Uh, it was just like me and just the greatest folks. So that's pretty much our first three weeks. We're in civilization. Um, we're having a lot of fun with people along the river. Now things are going to change. We've got Lake Winnipeg there, which is 300 miles long. Uh, cold when we came through. The water temperature was such that you'd maybe last about 10, 15 minutes, then you'd be incoherent. Very temperamental. Then there's another 400 miles that come from here over to this lake and then up to York Factory. And there's a village here, and there's a village here, and then that's it. Other than that, it's pretty much pure wilderness. Southern Shore Lake Winnipeg is very, very pretty. Lots of rock and <clears throat> forest. We couldn't believe our luck. Lake Winnipeg can sock you in for a week at a time, and you're going nowhere. But this is what it did the first evening for us. And so we kept paddling. And kept paddling. Now, that's midnight. But we weren't done. We'd come to this long point, and we could either spend all day going 34 miles down into this bay, or we could make a six-mile jump across. And we decided to make that jump at night. And our reasoning at the time was, well, the wind won't come up at night. <laughs> Which, yeah, I heard somebody laugh, and it's like, yeah, no, it can come up at night. <laughs> but it didn't. And we made it across, and we were pretty proud of ourselves. Uh, this is a, a real mild day on Lake Winnipeg. Uh, people always ask us, well, what are these goofy white things? Well, we're from Iowa, so, you know, we've never seen big water like this, and so we were afraid of it. So with our limited money supply, we bought those outriggers. We thought, well, I'll save us. <laughs> God, they're worthless. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hank did the dishes once. <laughs> Eastern Shore is very rocky. Uh, we almost died the day after this. Uh, we, we're getting pretty cocky on Lake Winnipeg. We're cutting bays and everything's going fine. But on the day I'm talking about here, we just had to make about a three mile jump. And uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. Wind's blowing maybe five miles an hour. We got halfway across and we heard this wishing noise. And we're like, what is that? And it kept getting louder. And then you can see the surface of the water turn dark blue. And it's the wind. And you can see it, and you can hear it coming. I've uh, never seen anything like it in my life. The wind went from 5 to 25, 30 miles an hour in three minutes, just like that. Um, the waves picked up quick and started breaking over. And that was a tight spot, because if we'd gone in the drink there, we'd have probably frozen before we could have made it to shore. And the other canoe wouldn't have been any help, because they would have been busy trying to stay afloat themselves. But we managed to fight our way over to the lee of that island and get out of the wind. We were a little more careful after that. Not a lot. <laughs> you know, when you're that age, a little really means just a little. 